so much. Mm -hmm. I pray for it. It's been a rough season for health and fitness. Well, it's just the uh, stuff that goes around right now. Yeah. Hey, good to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to be out again. Good to see you in the house of God today. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians. Philippians 4. I think there's only four chapters in Philippians, so you ought to be able to get there pretty easy. Pray that you've had a good week. Thank God it's still the weather. We don't have snow. That's always nice. Philippians 4 and 1. I don't know who knows what the name of Philippians is. I think we say it's a joy. Um, that's, I guess that's man-made stuff, but there's a lot of uh, good stuff in Philippians outside of just being a book of joy, I guess. Uh, we'll read the first uh, eight verses, if that's all right. Uh, I've read something in the NIV today that was disconcerting, or maybe the ESV, so I was in Romans, I think, 8. And the, and the ESV, where Romans starts, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walks not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the ESV, or the NIV, took out who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And I thought that was, that's not good. That part needs to be in there. So I'm, I'm always on watch when I use different versions. I make sure that um, try to make sure that it's lined up with the King James version. Amen. Um, but I believe this is a read from the King James version. I believe today, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to a church and a group of people that he clearly enjoyed. I think he uh, said at one point he. Praise God every time you thought about them. So that's a good feeling to have about somebody. And clearly, uh, they was good to him, and I think he was a blessing uh, to them as well. Philippians 4, 1 through 8. Therefore, my brother, beloved, dearly beloved, long for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord. Somebody say, stand fast. Yeah. My dearly beloved. Uh, I beseech you, Euodius, and beseech Sintic that they be of the same mind in, uh, in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, uh, help those women uh, who labored with me in the gospel, with women also, and with other uh, my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. I guess he. Doesn't need to mention everybody, but he let you know these folks are saved. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing or be anxious for nothing. But don't have any anxiety, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Now guard your hearts 
and minds through Christ Jesus. Uh, this is where my focus is tonight. Uh, chapter, verse 8. Finally, brethren, as the household of faith, the brethren in the name of the household of faith, it's not a group of males, but the whole household of faith. Uh, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And I guess if I wanted to share maybe an idea, it would be uh, as a man thinketh. Uh, there is a proverb that uh, says, as a man thinketh, so is he. But uh, the context doesn't fit as much, but, but, the, but the phrase does. As a man thinketh, as a woman thinketh, so is she. So is she. As a man think so is he. And also, as a subtext, uh, think on these things. Think on these things. These are the right things to think on. Uh, the Christian is to offer an instruction on how we ought to think. We live in a society where you, you know, people don't, you don't want to be, you don't know, even Christians, you don't, they don't want to you to tell them what to do, let alone think. Uh, but the Bible comes along and says this, this is if you want to guard three things in your life that are important, then you're going to have to consider how you think. Uh, your morals uh, and your motives. Okay? Your morals, um, your motives. Uh, these, these things are going to be vital. Um, in your manners, your, your both of your morals and your manners, and these, these things are going to be important if I was to ask you about these things and, and how you felt about them, you'd say, well, these things are important. And because they're important to other people that you know, what are their motives? Do they have good motives? Do they have good manners? Okay, these things are important. Uh, and do they have good morals? All these things are important. So, so these things will be specifically tied to how you think. And, and, and how you think, is the Bible's going to give us a list, maybe of six things, I think that's what we got here. Of six things that are going to help you guard your motives and protect your morals. Uh, these things can slip in our lives, our manners. Um, make sure we don't come to God's house. We're not coming in with shades on, hats. Take those things off. Guard yourself. Don't let your behaviors go anywhere. So it's going to be directly tied to how we think. Thinking is important. In 1972, and surely when I was young, the United Negro College Fund started a scholarship program to help people go to college. And, and black folks, uh, up to then, I don't think as a whole, had really considered the importance of college and how it was going to affect their long term life and the quality of life, the amount of money you would make over the course of time. And even today, there's a lot of people don't see any value in it. I don't know if it's for everybody. Uh, skilled trades are important, and they also pay just as much. But they had a slogan. Who remembers the slogan? The, the Negro Indians. <laughs> it's their language. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, I love it. I'll never forget it. The mind, it is, I think it is almost as sticky as the one that uh, uh, Hallmark had. What was Hallmark's? When you care enough to send the very best. Uh, slogans are really sticky. You know, they, they drive a company or a business a lot of times when Nothing else is going really good. But that slogan is powerful. So they have a slogan of mind is a terrible thing to waste. So, so we uh, we want to link right away our minds uh, with our thinking because that's where the thinking is going on. And Paul has instructed us to think on these things. Why? What was the situation? What was going on? In, in, modern, in, a, in a modern and uncertain world, our fears are more and more intense. Our anxieties can be crippling. Anxiety can be crippling, and I don't care if you're a strong, uh, uh, confident man or an elderly uh, widow. Everybody has to deal with fears and anxiety, yes. negative thoughts, yes. negative thought patterns. Uh, they can 
it is very overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, my daughter, she, she battles a little bit of anxiety. And, you know, sometimes we pray and sometimes it's something else. You know, sometimes it may need a little medicine. But it's real. It's not, it's not it's anything that's fake. It's very real. We, we were starting a mental health initiative with uh, my wife and I in this church. And we're taking a step by step. We're seeking to secure a grant so that we can address mental health, how people think, and how it affects them. Amen. Me receiving Jesus Christ, uh, when I received him, uh, I still couldn't shoot with my left hand after I got saved. There, there was things that were that was, that was maintained, I guess, that outside of having salvation. He didn't fix the gap in one of my teeth when I got saved. So, so we have physical issues that remain despite salvation sometimes, most of the time. I never seen somebody get saved and all, all their issues walked away because they received Jesus Christ. No, that's not, that's not, they don't happen like that. So we have to deal with negative thought patterns that are overwhelming sometimes. Worry, confusion, doubt, emotional stress, depression, anxiety are, are constantly on our mind. We're in a broken state and we need God's word and his help. Uh, we give our fears a lot of times more power and, and it is possible to give your fears uh, there's nothing wrong with the power of things in my mind and anxiety we, sort of, we, we can fuel anxiety you know instead of dousing these things that Paul's dealing with be anxious for nothing and he sort of he sort of precipitates uh, the six things that he wants us to think on or some of the issues that were going on sort of under the surface and without saying, you know, brother Don got problem with anxiety. He just says, be anxious for nothing. Right. Well, what about Brother John Alvin? Don't be anxious for nothing because anxiety is a problem. What's the problem with that? Yeah. And, 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 it, and it's something we deal with in our mind. Okay? And many of us also use our imagination in the wrong way. So when we begin to think, we're imagining things. Okay? Uh, let's uh, go to the Stoics. Let's see what the Stoics say. So Seneca says that we suffer more in our imagination than in what? Than in reality. And that's true. We, we suffer more thinking about what could happen and what ain't happening and what ain't going to happen. Okay? Then we then actually we actually go through stuff. You can spend all day and all week and all month thinking about a speech, and the speech was six minutes. The speech was two minutes, and you spent six weeks growing gray hair because you know because we suffer. As Seneca says, the Roman philosopher says, we suffer more in imagination. And this is true. Yeah. It's in his book, The Shortness of Life. It's a great philosophical essay. Uh, well, there's nothing wrong with addressing what the Stoics said and, and those philosophers. Remember Paul when he was at, uh, in the book of Acts, he, when he said, uh, in him we live and move and have our being. He was actually quoting one of the poets of old. So there's nothing wrong with drawing good common sense things from these people. It doesn't make you a heretic because we quote someone who said something. It may not even be an atheist. It, it can still contribute common sense reasoning things that would help us. The human mind is a battleground. It is a battleground. Uh, tame the negative reflections. Conquer internal judgments. Okay? Tame negative reflections. We can do that so here in the human mind. We can conquer the internal judgments and reduce the number of times that we compare ourselves to others. Okay? That, these are things we don't want to do. We don't want to compare ourselves to one another. Okay? That, that self-criticism that we're often guilty of. Because the brain is awfully good at digging up destructive patterns. Okay? And, and if we don't consistently interrupt that process, 
Remember, Paul told them one time, we have to uh, cast down imaginations. What's that shooting they do when they don't lay up the thing up here and they shoot the things they pull? <laughs> ski shooting? Well, as Christians, we have to ski shoot in our mind. We can't, if you know it's going up and it's no good, shoot it down. That's part, that's your portion. That's our job. He said, what's your job as a Christian? There are many, but one of them is shoot down stuff that you know has no business blowing up in there. Whether it's hate, envy, jealousy, uh, wrath. Get, get it down from there. You know, like you yell at a kid climbing. Get it down. Come down. Come down. Same way we have to do in our minds, okay? If you don't interrupt the process, it will continue to exaggerate uh, into the worst case scenario and it will rob you of your best life. You hear people saying all the time, I'm living my best life. Are you? Are you? Because you can have less stuff. You can have less material stuff. You can have a smaller house, a, a, a less expensive car, and less clothes, and live a higher quality life than someone else who has significantly more. Because of the quality of people you have around you. Well, you got quality of people, you don't need a whole lot to live a high quality life. Stuff won't give you a high quality life. No. That's why these celebrities are filling themselves up with drugs and killing themselves. Because stuff don't do it. High quality people around you. High quality life. Don't let anybody fool you. The Bible says, you know. Godliness with what? Contentment. That's great gain. Uh, Paul Cohel says, fear of failure leads to failure. So, so again, this life is a battle that has to be won in the mind. That's what Paul said. Let's just mind underneath the surface in Philippians 4, 1 through 8. Until you can overcome all these what if, what if, what if, uh, you ponder over daily, the peace of mind will be elusive to us. And we want peace of mind as Christians. One of the things that the pandemic did was it instilled fear, and we didn't instill the word. It instilled fear, and we didn't. God has not given me fear. But yet we were all acting out of fear. Us, us pillars of faith. All of a sudden, this cold came. And it demobilized them. But the Bible says, I didn't give you the spirit of fear. So, so you act accordingly, but not act out of fear. So, so whatever you do, that's fine. But, but don't do it out of fear because that didn't come from him. He don't need to scare you to get you to do anything. God has not given us the spirit of fear for what? Power. Power, number one. You got power. That's what I need. Love. God love you. It's self-discipline. Life unfolds from the mind. Well, where does what life begin to happen and unravel? Not, not in the hour, but in the inward. A great performance all starts right here. When I used to play football, I would spend uh, that day thinking about how I was going to, what I was going to do. And then if I didn't like that team, I was really doing bad. I would start thinking about the moves I was making. And, and, and I would think about moves I saw other people doing. I said, I'm going to do that. I saw Walter Payton do this, and I'm going to try that move. And then when I got out there, I took what was in my mind, and I put it out there. So, so life unfolds right here. However you're living, what you're doing, whether you like it or not, it didn't start out there. Started right here. So don't try to fix out there. You can think about this. This is the problem. Okay? It unfolds from the mind. If you consistently think of bad outcomes, what's going to happen? Everything's going to come out wrong. With your present life, your brain won't have enough cognitive energy to figure out the best way to live a better life. How can you have peace if you don't have peace in here? A lot of times the turmoil and the ruckus 
and the hubbub that we deal with is because we don't have peace here. You can't fix it out there if you don't trust this. Amen. So, let's get a definition that's always important. The mind, according to one or two different sources, is the element of a person that enables them to be aware of the world. It's how you take it all in. Uh, I don't know if I could get this right. Uh, I think uh, with the mind, I believe we have the self-conscious with the spirit. We have a God conscious and with the body, we have world conscious. If you didn't have the body, the world wouldn't know you was there. <laughs> if you didn't have a mind, you wouldn't know you was there. And if you didn't have a spirit, you couldn't connect to God. So, you find out the mind is what? It, it makes me aware, okay, of the world around me. And to their experiences, it allows us to think and feel. It is the faculty of reason and conscious thought. So, when a brother is not listening to nobody, when he can't reason with anybody, if you can't talk to your sister, if she won't listen, what do we say? She lost her mind. It is our intellect. Okay? Epictetus, let's go to another uh, stoic, says this. He reminds us of this. This is important. I like this today, so I wrote it down. It's not things that accept us. So when we upset us, but so when we talk about think on these things, remember, it's not a, the thing that uh, actually upsets you. It's your opinion of that thing that upsets you. Uh, the thing is objective. It, it just is. Traffic doesn't wake up every day and say, I'm really going to get on John's nerves today. I can't wait to get on. Uh, traffic doesn't do that. It, it's my opinion about traffic. Events are objective. They just are. Uh, objective means it is verifiable information based on facts and evidence. And then things can be subjective, which means uh, it's just my opinion or my emotions or my perspective on something. So the pandemic, the market, uh, the stock market, the traffic that we deal with, none of these things are trying to upset us. None of them are trying to give us anxiety. They just are. You can get anxiety in traffic by how you allow it to affect you. Uh, they don't upset us. They're, they're not trying to upset us. They're, they're just, it's our opinion that upsets us, even how people think about us. Doesn't really matter. It just, that's what you think. It can only upset me about how I feel about how you think. The problem is in the mind. It's the telling myself that that's unfair. That's what upsets me. You know, something stinks. That, that's what upsets me. It, it's my opinion of it. It's how I think about it. And it's our thinking, I've been injured by this person. And I'm not going to recover. But, but when we choose to say, I don't feel harmed by that. I, I respect your opinion, but I don't, I'm not going to let that affect you. Okay? When we do that, uh, Marcus Aurelius says in, in, in his meditation that we haven't really been harmed. Um, so the problem is always in our thinking. Look what the Bible says about our thinking and how we think and how we sin. He says they're interconnected, James 13 through 15. He says, no man should say when he is tempted that God did it. Because a lot of times, you know, they say, Lord, why you, why you put me through this thing, you know? I've seen this woman, and now, you know, say, you tempted me like that, because you know she's fine, Lord. Or you know he's fine, Lord, and you know I can't take him calling me. Uh, when tempted, no one should say God is tempted. Why? Because God can't be tempted by you. He can't be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Did you know that God don't tempt you? The prayer is, lead me not in true temptation. Don't let me go in places I know I ain't got no business going. God does not tempt anyone. 
James 1 and 14, but each person is tempted here. Here it is. When they are dragged away by their own Ooh, yeah. By my own thing. So, so I have this. We, we can't throw this mind out. That this is going to be intricate to your spiritual life, your walk, you being promoted, you getting a husband, you getting a wife. Everything in your life centers around your feet. And if you want to elevate your life, you got to elevate your things. And, and you will not grow outside of your circle. That's what I've learned. I work with people all the time. And I get around them. And if I find out that somebody thinking can't be elevated, I'm talking about go. I, the Bible said Jesus could do no miracles in certain places. Jesus, the Almighty, God in the flesh, couldn't do any miracle because of the way they thought. They didn't have no faith. He ain't superimposed yourself on the life. Christ did. But the proof is in the book. He just kept on going. And you got to keep on going too. When, when we're dragged away by our own desire, and desire happens up in here, and then we're enticed. Okay, your thinking, your failure, your thinking, your success are directly tied together. So if you're struggling, or if you're doing well, well, I'm just thinking. I'm doing good. You keep thinking that way. I'm saving money now. I realize that I can't give Freddie all my money. These kids, they get all my money. They can't get a job like everybody else. But if your thinking doesn't change, your situation ain't going to change. <coughs> what, 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 what's one way that a group of people ain't all men or dogs? If you don't change your thinking, you ain't never going to get no man. All we would do is take your money. I ain't gonna get me one. You won't be single for a long time. Because the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says it's easy to find a wife, find a good man, and obtain favor with the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. I'm right here. I just got a right go. I got a favor. The mind, Seneca, let's go back to the Stoics. I'm going to quote the Stoics today. He says, the mind must be given a relaxation. You've got to rest your mind. Somebody say, rest my mind. If you rest your mind, give your mind rest. I get up on the computer during the course of the day and just walk around, take a walk. If you give your mind relaxation, it will rise up, improve, and sharper after a good break. Okay? On the other hand, the late great Eleanor Roosevelt says this, you are complicit in feeling bad. If you feel bad and someone else you say is the reason, then they may be half of the reason, but you're the other half. You are complicit. She said no one has the right or can make you feel inferior without your consent. It's only when you actually believe this foolishness is when the trouble comes. You know. I was talking with my son and my son the other day. He said, Daddy, you can hold now. I can beat you up. Well, I just smiled. Whatever. Because I'd beat the best out of him. <laughs> That's his way of things. He young there, he's 20 years old. But that's what you think. But I am strong. And I'm bigger than you. But I couldn't have been upset. I, I had to let him allow me to be upset. But I think some of it would have been to maybe the only way to be upset was if I thought it was actually true. But it ain't true. So we're going to find out what sort of things firstly we need to be thinking on is true. Let that boy think whatever he wants to. But just don't come over here because I have you in the head like you crying to your mama with your grown self. 240 pounds, you 180 pounds. What are you going to do? This is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. 
So, how do we pre-program our brains to produce better thoughts? I guess that's what we deal with. So, so we have our, our mind is broken up to three areas, right? We, we have what we do consciously, right? Then we have what we do what? Unconscious, and also what? Subconscious. And I think that the subconscious is affected by the conscious. Because if I consciously do stuff all the time, I'll find myself, even when I'm not thinking about it, doing it. I say, oh, I just, I'm, I'm a creature of habit. That, that's why we've got to have good patterns in our Christian life. Because when, they, when the going gets tough, Ain't nobody even got to tell you to do it. You build, build yourself up in the most holy way. Hey, so, so that you know exactly what to do. When you, when you build yourself up, you know. When you build yourself up. You remember Joseph, he built himself up. So, so when he went into a place that was extravagant, like Egypt, that his thinking was so strong that when his beautiful wife, when his, beautiful, his boss's beautiful wife came, he said, how can I do this thing against God? He, his thinking had elevated. And he had thought on the name one that was true. He said, you're not good. This is not what God wants. Okay? How do you build this mind up? This subconscious, uh, this conscious, this unconscious, how, how do all these things work, okay? Um, Philippians 4. Paul is dealing with the peace and the joy that we have in all circumstances, okay? Um, at the beginning, if you'll go, we read about these two women named Eudia, Eodia, I can't really say it very well, and I don't know how they have these crazy names. Sintite, like Sintish. Apparently, these two women were in some sort of quarrel in the church. And instead of taking sides, like we often do, or trying to solve the problem, this is what Paul simply told them to do this. He says, be of the same mind in the Lord. I, I love it, because my bishop, uh, Bishop Winburn, when I, I try to come to him and say, Bishop, wants to go to me? And he said, I don't want to know what to do. A lot of people say, tell me, tell me. I want to hear all about it. He would never say that. He said, let's pray. Because I, and I like that Paul did that. He, he didn't want to really know what was going on between these women. Because it's not important. Because a lot of times all people want to do is get close to you so they can tell why you did it. They just want to tell. You want me to confirm. They want to confirm what we already know anyway. Is that there ain't nobody perfect. But, but Paul doesn't do that. He's not messy. Okay? He just tells them the answer. Be of the same mind in the Lord. It don't matter what y'all deal with. How long y'all date the same guy or you used to date somebody, you got a child. Well, it don't matter. Be of the same mind in the Lord. Remember, and he said the same thing in chapter 2. He said, let this mind be in you. That's also in Christ Jesus. And he said, how is it going to happen? He said, you're going to have to humble yourself. He said, You're, they're not better than you, but, but, but express themselves as better than you. Let each esteem each other higher than yourselves. That they're not higher, but esteem them higher. Amen. So we tell them to be of the same mind, whatever the dispute was. Uh, they had forgotten, these two women in this text, had forgotten they have a greater common ground in Jesus Christ. And this is what we have to remember as a church. There's more than what Pastor John has going on. There's more than what Lady Lynetta has going on. Okay? We have to have the mind of Christ. Our common ground is in Jesus Christ. We're how we think. Okay? And then he's going to share with us these six things. They had forgot everything else was less important than that common ground. Remember, he, he, he tells us, I urge you as your true companion. He, instruct, he instructed these uh, women to, uh, they had helped him to labor in the gospel. Okay? Um, but he, he starts, as always, he, he lets them know, you know, rejoice in the Lord. 
if you, a lot of times we struggle because we forget to just rejoice. Rejoice. If you're really down, you would be shocked about what rejoicing will do. You say, well, it ain't no time to, to give God praise. It's always time to give God praise. That, that's an elevated style of thinking. Give God praise in every situation. That's what he said. In every situation. And it's those situations that are hard a lot of times. We, it's hard for us to say, hey, he says, hey, guys, everybody be of the same mind. Doesn't matter what the issue is. Be of the same mind in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Okay? Always. And, and again, he says, I rejoice. Now, remember, Paul's joy wasn't based on sunny optimism or, or a positive mental attitude. It, it was the confidence that what God was in control. It was really just what we say. It was joy in the Lord. That God is in control. Now, Charles Burton says, what a gracious God we serve who makes delight to be a duty. It's your duty. It is your duty to be to delight in the Lord. It, it is your onus to rejoice in the Lord. And when we, when we advocate joy, worship, praise, honor to God, we advocate what God has called us to do. We've left our post. Give God praise in every situation. Rejoice in God in every situation. Okay, praise the few of the enemies. Spurgeon goes on to say, um, and who commands us to rejoice? Give God is our duty. Should we not at once be obedient to such a command as this? It is intended that we should be happy. Amen. Well, we've got six things that he's called us to do, and I just want to touch on them. So he, he, he says, in order to fix some of these issues we have going on in our relationships, in our lives, and in our thinking, he said, I'm going to tell you what to think about. And, and, and this isn't a full list, because when he gets to the end, he said, guess what? If there any, be anything of your report, any praise worthy, think on those things too, because in case I forgot, Amen. Praise worthy. That's good. Worthy to be praised. What should we be thinking about these things? Number one, whatever things are true, you can get go to the pit thinking about stuff that either is not true or ain't happening and ain't never going to happen. So, so put those on your list of what not to think about. Untrue stuff. Lies are from the devil. Ain't for no child of God. The Bible says gossip dies when it hits wise ears. Now, if you're a wise Christian, don't be carrying no gossip around. Don't be a conduit for the devil. The devil got a lot of people on the side that call themselves Christian. Don't carry that foolishness around. God knows how to deliver stuff back to us. If you talk about somebody, God knows how to let it come back to you. He, he, he's funny like that. He said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you reap is what you sow. So, so if you think that that's my, the best lesson look, uh, taught is that old medicine. <laughs> so if you don't think it's any big deal to spread rumors about Brother Kent, wait till they start talking about you. And, and you did laugh when they said it about the other person, but when they came around, who said it? Then? But it was no big deal what I was doing. So God knows how to bring that back. So don't, don't think about stuff that, that you don't know to be true. The Bible says that the law be established on the testimony of two, two or more witnesses. A lot of times we'll, we'll send and we'll ratify something, stamp it and approve it, and ain't, ain't nobody told us nothing. We ain't heard no witnesses. Pass it, go, woo! Pass, like a bill in Congress. Don't do that. In, in a world where we are increasingly losing the resolve to believe an absolute truth. He says, think on this. True stuff. And if you approach anybody on any subject today, they up that they want to they want to sort of chop truth up and then throw it around frivolously. No. No, well, we, I, we don't know if that's true for you. We don't know. 
we do know that the Bible. His word is true. God is true. He, Jesus said, I am the truth. So how do you mean there ain't no truth? There's truth to that. His name is Jesus Christ and his word is true. Think on these things. Think on these things. And that's noble. Noble. The Bible says the Bereans were noble people. Do you know anyone business coming here and not thinking about being noble? Nobility. What, what is it? It means majestic. It, it's awe-inspiring. It's the opposite of trivial and frivolous. Trivial and frivolous. I think those words are the negative. is almost important as a positive because we get off on stuff that really is not important. I, I've been watching this project manager at work. His name's about going into that role. And I had a guy that sometimes I'll send him stuff and he won't send me nothing back. And the Lord showed me, he said, John, this guy, is, he is, he's on purpose. He, he divides out stuff that don't need no reply. He don't have time to address frivolous stuff. So when you approach him, you be precise. You be concise. And as Christians, we should be the same way. Okay? We, if it's frivolous and it's, it, it's foolishness, we don't trivialize the passage of time. Time is a gift. Paul told the Ephesians to redeem the time. Make sure you are adding up your time. Don't let nobody waste your time with frivolous, fraudulent, shaky talk and stuff. Don't waste my time. I don't have a lot of time here. And I need to use all my time. Come on, somebody. Teach it better than you can pack it. A seriousness about all things, no a nobility, a gravity. Well, we should have a serious sense. Don't let your mind go off of stuff that just don't make no sense. Mm -hmm. True. No. What sort of things are right? Morally pure and undefiled. Morally pure, uh, pure and undefiled. Not what is expedient or proper. Because that's a lot of times that's how we adjudicate. Am I, is this going to give me some gain? No! Is it the right thing to do? Is it the right thing to do? Not, not is it quick? Not is it fast? Not will it get me to the next level quickly? Is it the right thing to do? Not will it make this person happy or please this person? Is it the right thing to do? What did Joseph say? How can I do this thing against God? Because he was thinking about what was we have to think about what's right. It'll guide your steps every day. Amen. Don't be moving around here as no Christian and you haven't considered what things are right. Okay? And it will save you in the realm of cheating, where we're tempted, plagiarism, and relationships. If we mark as a fixed place in our journey what is right. Joseph was thrust into the beautiful life of Egypt, and that's what his words. How can I do this? And he began to think about what things were right. What happened? He punched in the word of God. Whatever thing Joseph. What's right? Do that thing. Think about that thing. Don't think about how pretty she is. Because that ain't gonna get you where you need to go. Think about what is right. And he did the right thing. Whatever thing is pure. Grooved in the realm of purity. Remember, Paul told Timothy, keep yourself pure. Where is that at? What scripture is that? Keep yourself pure. I'm going to have to get that because that text uh, is important. Keep yourself pure. Well, I had it. I thought it was. First thing. 2, 21, 22. Uh, he said, if you keep yourself pure, Timothy, not, not if you come to church, not if you sing, not if you preach, not if you teach, not if you give money away to feed the poor, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for God's use. A lot of times we want to get places and go places and do things, but we have a pure part of us. God uses pure vessels. 
and, and, and the more you purify yourself, the more readily available you are for God. Amen. Yes. Yes. It, it's tough medicine. It's, it's, it's hard medicine to take. But the fact is, some of what God is doing and how he wants to, you know, his propensity to use them is based on us. Who was the bishop who took a major hit this week because he's been hanging around folks who wasn't pure? Bishop Jenks. Said he was at parties, puppies, partying, and all that. Man, I'm telling you, if you make a decision, you go, we're going to have to deal with the outlash and the backlash. He says your life will be clean. Paul told him in Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 and 21. He said you'll be ready. Meet for the master's use. Or ready for the master's use. Ready for every, every good work. Do you hear what I'm saying? Every good work. This, is, this, this should give you a lot of encouragement and excitement today. Because your destiny is in your hands. If you purify yourself, Leave that crazy talk alone. Leave that gossiping woman alone. I know she's been your friend for a long time and y'all been gossiping alone. Leave that cussing uh, drunk friend of yours alone and come out from among them and be you separate. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. And then Paul tells him, instead pursue righteousness, purity, basically faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Whatever things are pure, make all these things. He says, whatever things are lovely, not lovely like a Rembrandt or lovely like architecture or beautiful scenery, but pursuing what is acceptable and pleasing to God. It is the antidote to friction, really. Friction is, is easily produced in church and relationships. He says, so what is the, the lovely thing that is the antidote to friction and trouble and fighting is that realm of grace and mercy. Think about those things. Because it's so easy for jealousy and bitterness and envy and hate to grow up in a church, in a family, in a relationship. And he says, you need to think about lovely things yeah. that go, that, that, or that oil that helps smooth things out. Yeah. That grace, that mercy, that kindness, uh, that lovely thing. Oh, how lovely. Yeah. How lovely. He says, whatever things are admirable. Admirable. What is admirable? It's the things that build up and don't tear down. You don't want to tear your sister down. You don't want to tear your child down. You don't want to tear people who are already down, down. The Bible says that Bruce reads, he shall not break the smoking flax. He won't quench. What he's saying is when God sees you down, he don't kick you down. He builds up. He's a builder-upper. He's the great builder-upper. To do that one thing is admirable. You see an older lady crossing the street, What's admirable? Go help her across the street. Push her groceries out for her. Do something admirable. Think about what you would do that is admirable. For God's sake, for Christ's sake, think on these things. What can I do today that is admirable? What will God say? That's an admirable act. Think about those things. We used to call them teacher's pet. He's called but, but God don't want you to be no pet. He wants you to think about things that are admirable to, to, to help you to guard what? Your morals and your motives and your manners. Do that. You said you got good manners with me. Help her across the street. Think about those admirable things. Help feed the poor. Help, help willows in distress. Do admirable stuff. Not to be a pet, but because God asks. Admirable stuff. Look for ways to do it. Okay? So, we got it. What sort of things are true? What sort of things are noble? What sort of things are right? What sort of things are pure? We talk about lovely things. That, that, that grace and mercy that goes is the antidote for friction in our lives. And we talk about admirable things. This list will establish 
and help you keep your motives. And if you think on these things, your motives, your manners, and your morals. Your motives, your manners, and your morals. And a Christian should be distinct in three things. Your motives. We don't have worldly motives. We don't have worldly motives. How, how do we know? How do we guard from it? Think on these things right here. How do we know that our morals are right? Right there. Pure things. Think about pure stuff. You know. You don't have to get away from stuff that's in your ear gate and eye gate. And start spending time thinking about the goodness of God. Be aware, the Bible says, those who stand, at least you fall. Okay? At least you fall. Uh, look people in the eye. Look them in the eye. Hey, look at the people in the eye. Shake people's hand. Be what you're supposed to be. Your manners are important. Think about these things. Okay? People see you, they see you behaving like that, you're helping people, you do an admirable act, they say, who is this person? Who is this sister Lil? Who is she? She must be a Philippians 4 and 8 woman. She's a Philippians 4 and 8 woman, the type of person that God loves. This church among us, this isn't sanctification by self act this isn't us sanctifying ourselves on our own. This is the genuine produce of God the Holy Spirit in your life. This isn't a, a self-help class. I'm telling you what Scripture screaming for. What God has been knocking on the door to get you to do. It, this is not coming from the outside. This is going to come from the inside. Uh, the hardest thing to change in the Christian life is the mind. So Paul says in Romans 12, he says, uh, be not transformed, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing, the reshaping of your mind. How do you used to think? That old way of thinking. You know, I, I had a friend that he talked to every girl he see. And I said, why do you talk to all of them? And he said, because if I talk to all of them, a few of them are going to see. <laughs> I said, Jesus, you need to get saved. <laughs> you got to get saved. Your life is going to be hell. When two of them say, yeah, they're going to be fighting each other and fighting you. <laughs> but as a Christian, we're no better if we don't change the way we think. Yeah. This isn't a suggestion. This is God's command. This is fruit growing on the tree of salvation, and they are roots embedded in grace. Let's, let's bow our heads for a word. For Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this faculty of reason that we have. Our minds is such an amazing organism. Uh, the, the, the scientists say that the capacity to store information in the human mind is endless. Well, what an awesome God. We have infinite minds. Help us to see the beauty of it and not use it as Paul said, a use it a cloak of maliciousness, but a way to be blessed to other people. Help us to look for admirable ways to help people. Help us to have pure thoughts. Hallelujah. Help us to think on things that are lovely, kind, and just. And and if there any, be anything else today that we didn't talk about, help us to think on those things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you. God bless you. May his grace shine upon you. Give you peace. Brother Kent, it's good to see you back in the house of God. Got some items for you inside my office.
this week we had several hundred dollars of giving, six or seven hundred dollars of giving from people that don't even go to our church. Committed to giving on the weekly. You know what? Why don't we come to our church? God is good. If you want to give, it's up this way. One of them was Sister Joan from Montana. She's a former member of the body. She moved out of the city. And the other one is my sister Janine. And I told her that she needs to be paying her tithe somewhere. And what better place than her brother's church? But, but she has three brothers that are pastors. So she splits it up. <laughs> so we give God thanks. Tell you what. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, magnificent. God is good. 